Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presenting officer, earlier this week, three of our leading business groups in Scotland said this about the powers coming back to the UK after Brexit. They are not that concerned about where the powers ultimately reside. They just want the UK and Scottish governments to work together on a shared approach which maintains the UK single market. Can the First Minister really say that her actions this week have achieved that goal? First Minister. Well, I am and always have been prepared to work with the UK government on a shared basis. On the basis of mutual respect, that's not what is happening. I've said all along that the consent of this parliament to any removal of this parliament's powers, even for a temporary period, must be a matter of fundamental principle. So let me spell out to the chamber today what it is that this parliament is being asked to sign up to. We have been asked to sign up to an agreement that would allow the powers of this parliament in areas that really matter, like agriculture, fishing, the environment, state aid, public procurement, for example. We've been asked to allow these powers to be removed for a period of up to seven years without the consent of this parliament. And that's something I think that every single member of this parliament uh, really must consider. So perhaps instead of nonsense about the fact, uh, according to Ruth Davidson, that this government is somehow being unreasonable, surely there is a duty on all of those members of parliament who think that we should sign up to this agreement to set out clearly and in substance why they think it is reasonable. So I'd give uh, Ruth Davidson this opportunity today if she thinks that the agreement we have been asked to sign up to is reasonable, will she take the opportunity here in this chamber today to read out the sections of the UK government's amendments that deal with the consent of this parliament? I challenge her to do that. Let's see if she's confident enough. Ruth Davidson. The powers in dispute are powers and areas that this First Minister wants to send directly back to Brussels. And if she thinks, if she thinks she's helped provide certainty this week, why has she blocked a deal that would have done exactly that? Why is she putting her own political goals first? Because the UK government, the UK government didn't get everything it wanted this week, and nor did the Welsh government. Yesterday, the Welsh Financial Secretary, Mark Drakeford, said it has meant compromise on both sides. That is the art of negotiation. And I believe the outcome is a mature agreement between governments that is respectful of each other's interests. It sounds reasonable to everyone else. Why is it that the First Minister alone doesn't get that? First Minister. Well, Ruth Davidson asked why this matters. So let me uh, give a few examples of the real implications of us agreeing to what has been put uh, before us. Uh, for example, if we were to agree this, it would allow for a period of up to seven years, for example, the UK government to dictate new arrangements for farm support in Scotland. It would allow uh, the UK government to force uh, us perhaps to lift our ban on GM crops, uh, which is so important to our environment and the reputation of food and drink. It could restrict our ability during that period to properly tackle obesity and alcohol misuse. It could have forced us, it could force us to relax. They don't like hearing this. It could force us to relax food standards regulations and perhaps open the door to US chlorinated chicken and anything else that was demanded in a trade deal. And that's just some examples of the real implications. But presiding officer, I know that Ruth Davidson didn't accept uh, the opportunity to read out the sections of the UK uh, amendments. Be let me do that because it's important because this is what this parliament is being asked to agree to. Uh, so what the amendments say is that the UK government can't lay regulations to take away the powers of this parliament unless the Scottish Parliament has made a consent decision. Now, so far, so fair, perhaps. But then they go on to define what a consent decision is. That would be either a decision of the Scottish Parliament to agree a motion consenting to the laying of the regulations, or a decision not to agree a motion consenting to the laying of the regulations, or a decision to agree a motion refusing to consent to the regulations. So if we say yes, they'll take that as consent. If we say no, they'll take that as consent. And if we say nothing at all, they can take that as consent. It's heads, they win, and tails, we lose. Now, I don't think any self-respecting 
member of this parliament should give those proposals the time of day. And this government will not do that. And let me say this, presiding officer, if that means that we are the only party prepared to stand up for the rights and powers of this Scottish Parliament, then so be it. Ruth Davidson. I'm not sure the First Minister did herself any favours saying that this would stop her tackling obesity in Scotland. That does no favours to her argument. She's the only First Minister in history that wants to talk about the powers she doesn't have. And the bizarre thing is the SNP could have claimed victory this week. They could have claimed victory because they asked for powers to be devolved to Holyrood and not all held in Westminster and they got it. They asked for a sunset clause on regulations on devolved powers and they got it. They asked and demanded that any deal be by agreement and they got it. Now, we all, all of us, all of us in this chamber express concerns about the original proposals put forward. But as Lord Hope, one of Scotland's foremost judges said this morning, these are now being addressed in the amendments. So isn't it the case, isn't it the case that it doesn't suit the First Minister's political purposes to make a deal? So she's dancing on the head of a pin in order to find reasons not to. First Minister. Well, Ms Davidson said there that what we've been offered is an agreement where we would have to consent. That is manifestly not true. I pointed again to the amendments that have now been lodged that would allow the UK government, whether we agree or not, to go ahead and restrict the powers of this parliament in vital areas for a period of up to seven years. Now, I think it's for every member of this parliament to decide whether they think it is reasonable for the powers of this parliament to be removed for a period of seven years without our consent. That is the question that each and every one of us is going to have to answer. And I think as we do that, we're going to see uh, what every party in this chamber is made of and where their priorities uh, lie. Now, the fact of the matter is, I've said consent is fundamental at every stage of this process and I stick to that. I will not sign up to the restriction of the powers of this parliament for a period of seven years without our consent. Now, we have also, of course, offered solutions. There are two of them. Clause 11 could be removed and the effect of that would be that we would agree to sign a voluntary agreement, which is what the UK government is saying they will do. So there would be equity and respect on both sides. Or uh, Clause 11 could be amended to give the Parliament, this Parliament, the proper right to consent. If the UK government does either of these things, then we have a deal. It is perfectly reasonable. So let's see if Ruth Davidson has any influence whatsoever on her UK colleagues, or as usual, is she simply going to do whatever she's told? Ruth Davidson. The First Minister has multiple times there talked about claiming to be reasonable, but the reality that we have seen this week is nationalist MPs on the floor of the House of Commons turning on their erstwhile friends in Wales, accusing them of capitulating. Does that sound reasonable to her? Because we have seen this week, we have seen the SNP revert to tight, the same tired old lines from a party which isn't even trying anymore to reach out to people across Scotland. There is a deal to be done here. The Welsh have backed it, other parties in this chamber back it. Business wants her to back it. So I say to her, for once, will you do a deal in the national interest and not your nationalist interest? First Minister. This deal, this deal is not in the national interest. That's why I won't sign up to it. And yeah, that's the yeah. difference between me and Ruth Davidson. I... I don't agree with the decision Wales has arrived at, but I respect the right to take it. That's the nature of devolution. But surely Ruth Davidson is not suggesting that the policy of this parliament should be decided by the Welsh Labour Party, for goodness sake. And Ruth Davidson, Ruth Davidson appears to be oblivious to the current constitutional settlement. Right now, before a section 30 order can be passed, changing the nature of the powers of this parliament, this parliament has to agree to it. It can't be done without our consent. All we are reasonably putting forward is the proposition that that same rule should apply to any regulations restricting the powers of our parliament because of Brexit. Now, presiding officer, I know 
that Ruth Davidson's view is that we should simply let Westminster do what it wants. Yeah. Uh, that is why Ruth Davidson... That is why Ruth Davidson is so shamefully silent while her party deports British citizens. It's why she is so shamefully silent when her party imposes the rape clause uh, on women and forces more people to food banks. But you know, it is one thing to put up with grotesque Tory policies in areas that are out with our responsibility. That's bad enough. We should not ever open the door to that in areas that are our responsibility. This government, this government will not do that. And as I said earlier, presiding officer, if that makes us the only or the last party prepared to stand up for the rights and the powers of this Scottish Parliament, that is exactly what we will do. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, can the First Minister tell the Chamber last year in Scotland on how many occasions did an emergency 999 ambulance take longer than one hour to arrive on the scene? First Minister. I don't have that precise information to hand. I will write to the member with it. What I do know is that our ambulance uh, service does an excellent job uh, for patients across uh, the country. Uh, and in doing that, uh, they are joined, of course, by all of those who work in our National Health Service. This government is supporting our National Health Service with additional resources. There are more staff working in our National Health Service and we will continue uh, to support our NHS and uh, that will include those who work so hard in our ambulance service. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. The answer to the question that I asked is 16,865. That is more than 16,000 people waiting more than an hour for an emergency ambulance. People in serious need of urgent care. People like Margaret Goodman from Sockey in Clackmannanshire. Margaret is receiving palliative care for brain cancer. She told me that just before midnight on Saturday the 9th of April, her husband Gavin found her curled up in excruciating pain. Her palliative care nurses came, declared it an emergency and phoned for an ambulance. Three times they phoned, two hours they waited, and with no ambulance in sight, Gavin got in his car and drove Margaret to Fourth Valley Hospital in Larbor himself. And First Minister, because they turned up on their own rather than in an ambulance, Margaret wasn't automatically admitted. She had to wait in a packed A&E late on a Saturday night. So she wasn't treated with morphine until three o'clock in the morning, and she didn't see a doctor until seven o'clock. First Minister, this is simply unacceptable, isn't it? First Minister. Well, the circumstances that have been outlined by Richard Leonard, uh, yes, I would say are unacceptable. Clearly, I don't know all of the circumstances, although Richard Leonard has shared uh, a, a great deal of information there. I will undertake today to personally look into the particular case and the Health Secretary will do uh, likewise. Uh, we expect the highest standards of care for patients across uh, the country and on occasions where that doesn't happen, it is very important that lessons are learned and applied for the future. Uh, as Richard Leonard will uh, no doubt be aware, the Scottish Ambulance Service has recently implement, implemented a new response model, which is designed to make sure that ambulances get to the most serious cases as quickly uh, as possible. The second phase of that model was implemented in October last year. So uh, the issues that Richard Leonard raises are, of course, uh, hugely uh, important. And I will, as I say, personally look into that and be happy to correspond uh, with him once I've had the opportunity to do so. Richard Leonard. Thank you. First Minister, uh, Margaret Goodman is in the gallery today. The debate about our NHS is not just about statistics. In the end, it is about real lives and real people like Margaret. And out in the real world, Scotland's health service staff are being failed. Those district nurses, our hospital doctors, those ambulance crews, they are all being failed, failed by your government. And Scotland's patients, they are being failed as well, including people like Margaret. First Minister, how much more failure must people endure 
before you finally realise that we need a change in our National Health Service, starting with a change of your Health Secretary? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I, can I recognise uh, Mrs Goodman's attendance here today and uh, if she received care that was not of the standard she expected from what Richard Leonard uh, has outlined today, it certainly appears that that is the case, then of course uh, she deserves an apology and I offer that to her. Uh, I will arrange for the Health Secretary to meet personally with uh, Mrs Goodman this afternoon if she wishes to take up uh, that offer. Um, more generally, I, I don't accept Richard Leonard's characterisation. Of course I accept that those who work in our NHS are working under uh, extreme pressure. That has always been the case and continues to be the case but we uh, are putting record sums of money into uh, the health service we see record numbers of people <coughs> working in the health service of course uh, we as uh, demand on the health service increases we need to not only invest but also reform the way the health service works uh, next week uh, i understand the third part of our national workforce plan focusing particularly on primary care and the wider primary care team, which will include district nurses, which have been mentioned by Richard Leonard, uh, will be published. Uh, so there is a great deal of work underway to ensure that our NHS is able to meet these challenges and this government will continue to support them every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, three constituency questions. The first from Richard Lockett. The First Minister may recall that we passed legislation in 2016 that means that fatal accident inquiries will now be mandatory for military deaths. And as a result, my constituent Jimmy Jones and myself are meeting the Crown Office on Tuesday to put the case to them there should now be an FAI into the RAF Tornadoes crash in the Murray Firth in 2012 that tragically claimed the lives of three aircrew. And where we will present new evidence to make the case for the issues to be properly examined in a Scottish court in a fully transparent manner following the internal inquiry that was conducted by the Military Aviation Authority. I do appreciate that decisions in FAIs are solely a matter for the Lord Advocate, but will the First Minister recognise and join me in paying tribute to the tenacious and determined campaign by Mr Jones, who has the support of the bereaved families? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, my thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of all of us, uh, remain uh, primarily and firmly with the families uh, of the, the victims of the tornado crash. Uh, tragedies like this are a reminder of the risks that are undertaken by our armed services, uh, even when they're away from the front line. And I think uh, all of us should have that in mind at all times. As Richard Lockhead has noted, decisions regarding fatal accident inquiries are a matter for the Lord Advocate and rightly a matter for the Lord Advocate. Uh, but I hope the meeting that he refers to is productive. And I am very happy in this chamber today uh, to recognise publicly the contribution that Jimmy Jones made to the framing of the new legislation that passed in 2016. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, as reported in today's Press and Journal, in my region there is serious public concern over a shortage of fire engine cover in Aberdeen, with appliances routinely stood down due to a shortage of crew. Today's joint statement from the FBU in the service states that processes will be improved. So can the First Minister tell the public what processes these are and what the improvements will be? And does she agree with ACO Ramsey that action should be taken to strengthen local decision making as more centralisation isn't the answer? First Minister. Well, yes, I, I do believe in the importance of local decision making and indeed deployment decisions, including the provision of fire appliances, are an operational matter for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, in terms of the situation in Aberdeen, I, I know that the fire service has uh, described this as a short-term issue and has also confirmed, I think very importantly, that there has been no situation where crews had not arrived as quickly as possible to incidents. Uh, the fire service, I understand, has met the Fire Brigade Union to discuss the issue in Aberdeen and following the meeting, uh, the North Divisional Organiser of the Fire Brigade Union uh, said that uh, he thought things were moving in the right uh, direction. Uh, following our meetings, he said, and the assurances we've been given, we think things are now moving in the right uh, direction. So I hope the member uh, will welcome that. Uh, and all of us, just as I said in relation to the National Health Service in the last uh, series of questions, all of us have a duty to support our firefighters as they do the vital work that they do. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. First Milk has announced it will sell Toriel and Creamery on the island of Arran, uh, opened by King George VI in 1946, and Mull of Kintyre Creamery, leaving workers and suppliers shell-shocked in the words of NFU Scotland. Toriel Inn produces high-quality, traditionally made cheeses, winning a Best Cheddar in the World uh, Awards in 2013. Can the First Minister say what the Scottish Government's response is to these successful creameries and premium bands being sold with their operations moved to Wales and Cumbria? 
and what can be done to minimise the impact on those who work at the creameries and the local supply chain, including Arran and Kintyre Farms? First Minister. Well, the announcement by First Milk to sell Campbelltown and Arran Creameries is very disappointing. Uh, by uh, their admission, the iconic products produced by these creameries uh, do not fit with their longer-term uh, strategy. However, the potential sale of the site uh, offers an opportunity for the right approach to be taken in terms of future ownership to achieve a sustainable future for the creameries, uh, for farmers and for local communities. <clears throat> the Rural Economy Secretary, I know, is already working with officials to explore all possible options to save these creameries, and this involves engaging fully with local agencies, partners, and importantly, the farmers themselves, uh, to work with any potential investors so that we can try to find a sustainable and viable way forward. And I know the Rural Economy Secretary would be happy to meet with Kenny Gibson to discuss the matter further. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. People everywhere have been shocked and disturbed at the scale of the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. It's regarded as the world's most severe humanitarian crisis at present, with tens of millions of people in need of help, and it is directly caused by Saudi Arabia's blockade and bombing campaign. The Scottish Government has contributed public money to the Disasters Emergency Committee's appeal in response to that humanitarian crisis. And members of the First Minister's party have joined Greens and others in opposing the UK government's arms deal with Saudi Arabia, which will continue to make that situation worse. Why then is Scottish Enterprise also giving public money to the world's largest guided missile manufacturer, Raytheon, which supplies Saudi Arabia? Is there not an immense contradiction between showing that legitimate and urgent concern for the victims of a humanitarian crisis caused by the brutality of the arms industry while still funding the arms industry. First Minister. Well, firstly, I agree with Patrick Harvey's uh, comments about the humanitarian crisis in Yemen and the causes of that. I don't think there is any uh, disagreement between us uh, there. Uh, let me turn, though, to the specific question about Scottish enterprise and the Scottish government's uh, responsibilities. And I want to be very clear about some of this. Firstly, we have to uh, recognise the importance of aerospace uh, and shipbuilding sectors in particular to uh, the Scottish economy. In total, uh, they employed 16,000 people in, in 2016. But, and this is an important point, the Scottish government and our enterprise agencies do not provide funding for the manufacture of munitions. Our agency support is focused on helping firms diversify and develop non-military applications uh, for their technology. Uh, and we have been very clear in our expectation that the UK government should properly police the export of arms and investigate wherever concerns are raised. So I'm always happy uh, to discuss uh, these issues uh, with individual members of parliament and we'd be happy to discuss it further with Patrick Harvey, but I hope uh, that is of some reassurance to him. Patrick Harvey. There must be a great many businesses out there uh, of all shapes and sizes throughout Scotland, who could benefit from that public investment in non-military activity, generating jobs and economic activity without the consequences uh, of funding the arms industry. And Raytheon is not the only example. We've also seen significant amount of money. Uh, th there's still some lack of clarity in the detail that the Scottish Government publishes, but it's been reported uh, that six million has been uh, received uh, by Leonardo, previously known as Celex, again from Scottish Enterprise, a company involved uh, in supplying the weapons being used by Turkey uh, against the Kurds in Afrin and elsewhere. There is an immense contradiction, surely, between what we say about the world stage, about humanitarian crises, and about the need to move away from military interventions which make these situations worse, not better, while continuing to fund the self-same businesses which profit from this activity. Glasgow City Council is also apparently promoting an arms fair at the moment which involves uh, undersea technology. The, the kind of weapons which the Scottish Government and many of the rest of us continue to oppose uh, in, in relation to Trident. Surely it is time for an ethical investment policy which moves away from the arms trade wholesale and invests instead in sustainable and ethical businesses. First Minister. Actually, it's important to focus on what Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise in particular's investment does. As I said in my 
First answer, the Scottish Government and our enterprise agencies do not provide funding for the manufacture of munitions. Uh, we have uh, been very clear that our support is focused on helping firms to diversify and develop non-military applications for the technology they use. Patrick Harvey mentioned uh, a, a company called Leonardo and it featured in the media at the weekend. Scottish Enterprise has supported Leonardo, which is a company based in Edinburgh, to diversify into non-military markets. Uh, the investment included supporting the company to target opportunities in blue light and civilian markets. So through this funding, uh, Leonardo developed uh, a radar system for launch by the Norwegian Search and Rescue uh, Service and uh, also helped them to secure a contract with the Royal Canadian Air Force for a system that protects aircraft uh, from heat-seeking missiles. So defensive uh, use of technology, not offensive uh, use of technology. So I think it's important. These are important issues that Patrick Harvey is raising. I absolutely recognise that. But if we're going to have a proper debate about them, uh, one that recognises our ethical responsibilities, which I take very seriously, but also recognises our responsibilities towards economic development, it's important to be clear about what Scottish Enterprise Investment does. So I hope what I've said today uh, is something that Patrick Harvey will reflect on, but I am, of course, uh, willing to continue to discuss uh, these issues, as Scottish Enterprise will be, uh, with members of Parliament who are interested in these issues. Question number four, Willie Rennie. When Caithness Maternity Unit was downgraded, local mothers were promised that there would be enough capacity at Ragmore Hospital in Inverness. Yet last week we heard Emma Moffat was forced to endure a 260-mile journey to the central belt to give birth because Rakemore was full up. I have raised this before and was told by the First Minister that safety was the priority. But for an expectant mother, how can a six-hour journey down the A9 be safe? Can the First Minister answer me that? First Minister. Well, I think it is important, and I know Willie Rennie uh, will accept this point. I, I think he accepted it uh, the last time. Uh, the decision to change the status of Caithness Maternity Unit was made not by Scottish ministers, it was made by NHS Highland specifically on safety grounds. And that decision was informed by a review they commissioned after the death of a child in September 2015. So mothers who are deemed at low risk will be able to give birth locally, and that's an important point to stress, uh, but higher risk mothers uh, will give birth in Ragmore, and that's a decision that was taken on uh, safety grounds. Uh, of course, any mother who is required to travel uh, any distance will be advised by midwifery staff around uh, how to transport uh, baby, and advice is already available in other uh, formats. So these are Again, important issues, but I think it is really important that we understand uh, the safety imperative that lies behind this. And NHS Highland, of course, uh, are very cognisant of the needs and concerns uh, of those uh, who have to travel to Inverness when, understandably, they would prefer to give birth locally. Willie Reddy. Ministers promised that people in Caithness, that Rigmore would be strengthened. Little did they know that that meant being sent to Livingston. Campaigners say parents now are now thinking twice about whether to have a family. What a devastating failure of government health policy that is. At the weekend, the chairman of the BMA said services across Scotland are deteriorating and patients are suffering. 99 GP practices are closed to new patients. Last week, I raised the tragic failures on mental health services. Others raised failures on primary care and emergency care. Even SNP backbenchers spoke out. And today, we've heard about the case of Margaret Goodman. And of course, there's the closure of the children's ward at Paisley. So how bad does it have to get for the NHS before the First Minister accepts that change is needed at the top? The Health Secretary has got to go. First Minister. Willie Rennie uh, quoted the, the BMA. Uh, the views of clinicians uh, are hugely important, and I think his quoting of the BMA uh, suggests that he thinks that too. He then mentions uh, the children's ward at Paisley, of course, which was a decision informed by the views of the clinicians that work with sick children. So Willie Rennie can't really have it both ways. Of course, the BMA uh, also said at the weekend that it recognised the record resources and staffing in our National Health Service. Yes, there are pressures 
in our national health service. Demand is rising on health services, not just in Scotland, but right across the developed world. That's why we are investing record sums, but it's also why we're doing the hard work to reform the way our health service delivers. And the uh, workforce plan, the last part of the workforce plan that I mentioned earlier on that will be published next week is looking at the multidisciplinary teams that are needed, particularly in primary care. On the issue, uh, to go back to the important issue of maternity services in Caithness, I, I hope all of us would agree that what is most important of all is that pregnant women receive safe and high quality care. On occasions where women and babies are required to travel to ensure that best possible care, we've got a network of special baby care uh, units. The Scott Star Service, which is operated by the Scottish Ambulance Service, provides a safe and effective service for patients who require support from an augmented clinical team. So these are important issues, but safety and the views of clinicians uh, have to be given uh, priority. And for the part of this government, uh, all of us, the Health Secretary, me and the whole government will focus on supporting our NHS through the investment and reform that it needs to continue to provide the high quality services that it does. Uh, services that continue to attract record high patient satisfaction levels. We have some further supplementaries. The first from Miles Briggs. Presiding Officer, First Minister, this week breast cancer patients, including my constituents in Lothian, stepped up their campaign to make the secondary breast cancer drug Progetta available on the NHS. Women in England have access to this drug, but Scottish patients still do not. Over a year ago, the Scottish Government committed to introducing a better system of negotiation to the cost of this new medicine. When will we see this put, system put in place, and what can the Scottish Government do right now to help make a deal happen to make Progetta available to, for Scottish women? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, to, to make a point I've made uh, several times in this chamber before, decisions on access to medicines are not taken by ministers, they're taken by the independent processes we have in place, uh, the Scottish Medicines Consortium in particular. Uh, the member mentions that this drug right now is available in other parts of the UK and not in Scotland. There will be other drugs where that is true in reverse. Uh, these are independent processes and I think all of us uh, should respect the independence of these uh, processes. Of course, it's the responsibility of government to provide proper funding. We've invested nearly £200 million uh, since 2014 through our new medicines fund and that has seen access to new medicines increase in recent years and we continue to work with the NHS and the pharmaceutical industry to build on this as we implement the recommendations of the Montgomery uh, review. Um, in terms of this particular drug, and I absolutely understand uh, the views of cancer patients who want access uh, to that, officials are undertaking uh, discussions with the pharmaceutical uh, company to try to achieve uh, a solution, uh, and the company needs to continue the dialogue with the national procurement in order to bring forward a submission at a fair and transparent price and at a price that is no worse than the price that they have offered in England and Wales. So uh, as I said earlier on, these are independent uh, decisions. They are rightly independent decisions, but this government through our funding and through the reforms of the Montgomery process will continue to do everything we can to ensure that patients have access to the medicines that they need. Christina McKelvey. Yep, thank you very much, President Officer. I know there are members of a brand new Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly watching in the gallery today, and I would like to welcome them to the Parliament and say that the Equality and Human Rights Committee are looking forward to meeting with them in the future. I also know that they're meeting with the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon. But does the First Minister agree with me that it's time that we ensure that in Scotland, the well-used phrase of discrimination against Gypsy Travellers has been the last form of acceptable racism in Scotland becomes an issue of the past in Scotland. First Minister. Well, let me, let me offer a, a warm welcome to the young Gypsy travellers who are here in the gallery with us today. The Gypsy traveller community does continue to face prejudice and discrimination, and I hope that across this chamber we can all agree that this is absolutely unacceptable and it has no place whatsoever in a modern and inclusive Scotland. Um, as Christina McKelvey knows, we've set up a new ministerial working group to drive improvements for this community at a faster pace. And I'm delighted that the Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly has been invited to speak at the meeting of that group next week. Uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary will uh, meet our visitors today, uh, this afternoon, and I hope that the Young Gypsy Traveller community will be regular visitors to this parliament in the future because they are most welcome. Neil Finlay. At the Brief Valley Medical Practice in my region, all of the GPs have resigned and there are zero applicants to take over. 
Patients from Stonyburn will no longer have a GP in their local health centre. And if they don't have a car, they will be forced to travel at a cost of £4.50 a time on the bus to another already under pressure health centre. Across Lothian, 40% of GPs have closed their waiting lists. Training places go unfilled and the system would collapse without locums. The health secretary is overseeing a disaster in general practice in our communities. For the sake of patients in places like Stonyburn, will you ask her to stand aside and bring in someone who will get a grip of this disaster in general practice? First Minister. The, the, the opposition might want to continue to play politics with us. We will continue to focus on the hard work of supporting our National Health Service and delivering for patients. Uh, there are a range of actions that the Health Secretary is taking to boost recruitment into general practice. Uh, we're also working to build the multidisciplinary teams that support uh, GPs. Uh, of course, the new GP contract will go a considerable way to addressing some of the concerns uh, that GPs have been expressing. Uh, the member mentioned training places. I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but the fill rate of training places this year, if memory serves me correctly, is higher than it was last year, suggesting that these actions uh, are starting to have effect. So, you know, there are challenges facing health services uh, all over uh, the UK and indeed all over Europe and the world, but we will continue to focus on providing the investment and taking the action that allows us to address these challenges and ensure that patients continue to have record high satisfaction in the services that they depend on. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it was announced on Monday that the Rosyth to Seybrugge ferry service is to be scrapped following a fire on the current vessel. This is a ferry service which has operated since 2002, first as a passenger and freight service, and more latterly as a purely uh, freight service. And its loss will be a significant blow to the Fife economy and the wider economy of the east of Scotland and reduce connectivity between Scotland and export markets in Europe. Can I ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government have had either with the current operator of the service, DFDS, or indeed any other operator about the possibilities for reinstating this important link? First Minister. Um, well, first, the, the Transport Minister spoke to DFDS, the current operator of the ferry, uh, earlier this week uh, and has also uh, had discussions, or officials certainly have had discussions with Forth uh, Ports to look at the range of possible options that might be available. Uh, it is deeply disappointing and regrettable that uh, this service has been withdrawn by the current operator. Uh, I was involved not long after I became First Minister in discussions with that company to secure the future of it. So the fire obviously was an unforeseen uh, circumstance that is regrettable, but we want to uh, make sure that we explore all options to get a service uh, running again. I, I will undertake, uh, or I will uh, give that an undertaking that the Transport Minister will keep uh, members of Parliament updated on the progress of his discussions. But there is an absolute determination, if it's at all possible, to see a service running again. Thank you. Question number five, Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the UK Government's EU withdrawal bill has been adequately amended to meet the approval of the Scottish Government. First Minister. Uh, no. Um, we are today lodging with the Parliament a legislative consent memorandum which will set out in detail our remaining concerns about the UK Government's proposals. Uh, but crucially, it also offers solutions that would protect devolution be consistent with the current devolution settlement and enable us to reach agreement. Uh, the bill has so far not been adequately amended. Uh, the latest changes, as I said earlier on, allow Westminster to override this parliament and constrain its powers for up to seven years. Uh, even if this parliament votes uh, not to give consent, uh, the UK government can turn that refusal into what it calls a consent decision in order to overrule the will of parliament. Uh, the Scottish government could not recommend approval to a measure which undermines devolution in such a fundamental way, but we will continue uh, to work to see if agreement can be reached. And even now, I hope that we can reach an agreement. Ash Denham. Thank the First Minister for that answer. So if I'm understanding this correctly, according to the amendments that were published yesterday, even if the Scottish Parliament expressly refuses consent, so let's say every single MSP in this place votes against having its hands tied by Westminster on matters to do with fishing or the environment or GM crops, the UK government could take that express refusal yeah. as the green light that it needs to go ahead and impose these restrictions anyway. Surely no party 
that has any respect for this Parliament or for the devolution settlement could sign up to that. First Minister. Well, Ash Denham is right in her interpretation and, well, look, the, the amendments are public. Every member of this chamber, and I hope before there is any vote on this, every member of this chamber will pay close attention to these amendments. It is not a requirement under these amendments for the UK government uh, to obtain our consent. It's simply a requirement for them to allow us to make a consent decision. But a consent decision could include a decision by this parliament to refuse consent. So if we say no, they can go ahead and do it anyway. That's a pretty strange definition of consent and not one that I have previously been uh, familiar with. Now, we have put forward two potential solutions. And I heard, I think, Jackson Carlow when I put them uh, forward before saying we want a veto. Actually, what we want uh, is uh, under, what, under one of these proposals, if Clause 11 was amended to allow consent of this parliament, that would simply reflect what is already the arrangement for other orders like Section 30 orders. So it's not something unprecedented. It's not something that doesn't exist. Or if Clause 11 was simply removed, we would enter into a voluntary agreement, which is what the UK government is offering to do to us. So we would both trust each other. Uh, but what the UK government wants is for them to have a voluntary agreement and us to have our powers restricted by law for seven years. No self-respecting. MSP in this chamber could possibly sign up to that. But if we were to come together and make clear to the UK government the basis on which a deal could be done, then we would get to a deal. So I think that actually the biggest question, I can understand why the Tories are not bothered about this. They want Westminster to be in charge. I cannot understand for the life of me why Labour, why Labour would agree to this. But we hear a lot, we hear a lot, do we not? about the supposed influence, the supposed influence of Ruth Davidson. So here we have an opportunity to put it to the test. If Ruth Davidson's got an ounce of influence, we'll get a deal, but I suspect she'll just roll over and do whatever her Westminster bosses tell her as usual. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to support children from families with a parent who have an alcohol or drug addiction. First Minister. Uh, we're currently providing uh, £600,000 a year to the Cora Foundation. Uh, the Cora Foundation supports Scottish voluntary organisations to deliver vital on-the-ground support to children and families across Scotland affected by substance and alcohol use. Uh, the investment we are making in strengthening child and adolescent mental health services will further improve the support available. Of course, it's better to seek to prevent the damage occurring in the first place than to treat it, which is why any response to alcohol harm needs to include preventative measures like minimum unit pricing which I'm pleased to say will uh, be enforced in Scotland from Tuesday next week. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? And I think we do have to accept that Scotland has an issue with its poor relationship with alcohol and drugs. And we know dependency is often a contributing factor in families experiencing domestic abuse and neglect. The NSPCC says there has been a 30% increase in calls to its helpline over the welfare of a child due to a parent misusing alcohol in the past year. We recently heard of the Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt, supported by the Shadow Health Secretary John Ashworth, announce a £6 million package of funding to help children with alcoholic parents get support and advice. And I wonder whether the First Minister would consider doing likewise uh, for children in Scotland and perhaps go even further and also include children with parents of other similarly destructive uh, addictions. First Minister. Well, as I indicated in my original answer, we already provide funding uh, to organisations uh, working in this field. The Cora Foundation, I mentioned, £600,000 a year to support children and families facing these issues. We also uh, provide £280,000 uh, in this year to Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs to support families across Scotland affected by a loved one's substance uh, misuse. Uh, and that includes signposting children and families to services and contacts in their local areas. So we already uh, fund a range of organisations to do this work uh, and we'll continue to look at ways uh, in which we can support them. It is absolutely right to raise issues about the impact of uh, drug and alcohol misuse and I absolutely recognise the responsibility of the government to take action in that regard. 
but prevention is, as I said, better than cure, which is why the comprehensive nature of our uh, strategy to tackle alcohol misuse is so important and why I think that the introduction of minimum pricing uh, next week after a delay of so many uh, years being caught up in the courts is such a positive step forward. And in years to come, I think it will be something this Parliament uh, will be really, really proud of. And John Mason. Hey, thank you. I wonder if the First Minister would agree with me that the third sector has a very important role to play in this. For example, Safe Families for Children, which operate in the east end of Glasgow, as often families will be more willing to engage with the third sector. First Minister. Um, yes, I agree very strongly with that. I appreciate all that our third sector and voluntary organisations do and the support they provide, and I see evidence of that in my own constituency. Um, as I've already said, alongside important local partnerships, the Scottish Government provides funding for a number of organisations at national level, including, as I indicated earlier, Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs who support uh, families across Scotland uh, dealing with these issues. So these are uh, important organisations and those working at local level are just as important as the national organisations that I've referred to. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Uh, Parliament uh, will be suspended. Business will resume at 2.30, but I would invite all members to gather again in the chamber for, uh, at one o'clock uh, and we will be able to hear from President Muturika. Thank you.